Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. Today we have a manga review of chapter 912, Amigasa Village. And we're going to start off this week with a bit of a fun fact based on the title. An Amigasa is a particular type of Japanese hat worn in a variety of different styles. Why is this in any way important? It isn't really, but it's a nice little story element that has come full circle. Because now we know that we are in the village where Ace learnt to make the Amigasa hat that he gifted to Oz Jr. And I just thought that was cool. And while we're here, we may as well begin the review properly by talking some more about Ace. I really like the little flashback we saw this week featuring him and the Spade Pirates. The whole letting themselves be tied up thing is a very classic heartwarming Oda thing to do. Although it does really make me wonder why they bothered to let themselves get tied up in the first place. I mean, if they were happy for the villagers to eat their food, then why not just say so from the get-go? I don't know. Whatever the case, it is nice to see the Spade Pirates. And I do think it was really cool that their ship essentially washed up on shore on Curry Beach in the exact same manner as the Thousand Sunny. That says to me that they also were not prepared to deal with the exceptionally Japanese waves of Wano. Moving along, we have some very interesting information about our Tengu man. His name is Tengu Yamahitetsu, the second name being very familiar, which we'll get to. But he is huge! I did not realize just how massive this dude was last chapter, but this week gives us some nice size comparison panels with Luffy, as well as some really comical ones where his nose is simply too long to fit in the panel. His design in general is really growing on me. Last chapter, I admit that I was very on the fence about Mr. Tengu, which tends to happen whenever I encounter characters with a more bizarre motif. But the way Oda makes use of him in terms of movement and character expression is perfect. He provides a very intriguing shape, and I found myself pausing to really take in most of the panels he was featured in. Plus, he really suits the environment around him. And just quickly on that, for the past couple of chapters, I've been nutting non-stop over how beautiful the general aesthetic of Wano is. But this week, my heart just broke when we got that shot of the wasteland with Kaido's factories in the background. Now, I don't really want one of this arc's major themes to become about the environment, but this is a pretty damn fine statement on what has been happening on this planet ever since the advent of industrialization. Which brings up an interesting thought actually, what exactly is Kaido making? The conventional answer is probably weapons and weapon related accessories given how driven he is in regards to plunging the world into war. But when I think about the industrial revolution my mind always goes to the textile sector because they were an absolutely massive part of that shift in the world. So maybe, so perhaps Kaido just wants to make some pretty clothes and maybe some curtains. Who knows? But we need to move back to Mr. Tengu because some pretty huge information has dropped on us this chapter being that he is a swordsmith as well as the ancestor of Kotetsu who appears to have been a member of the fabled Kitetsu school. These guys were responsible for the cursed blades known as the Shodai Kitetsu, the Nidai Kitetsu, and the Sandai Kitetsu. The last one should be very familiar to you because it is one of Zoro's swords, specifically the cursed blade. In fact, this whole series of swords crafted by the Kitetsu school appears to be cursed. Rather interestingly though, these swords were all made by different craftsmen, with this chapter revealing that it was Kotetsu who made the Nidai Kitetsu, now currently wielded by Luffy apparently. And at a glance, the Nidai looks very similar to the Sandai with indistinguishable cross guards and grips, at least to my eye. But the sheets do look different, so that's something, I guess. I suppose the cross guard and the grip might be more of a Kitetsu school branding, and the real character of the sword will be revealed as it should with the blade itself. Now all this sword talk coincides rather nicely with Luffy and Zoro's reunion. I love the final panel of this chapter with them both ready to fight, and to me, this duo looks absolutely unbeatable, because they just emanate such strength and confidence. There is no combination of two straw hats that I would like to face less than these guys. Hawkins doesn't seem too bothered though, which by the way, yeah, he just kind of pops up at the end out of nowhere. It's kind of jarring actually, because usually Oda is very clever with how he handles character interactions, and he's very good at making things feel quite natural. Unfortunately, this chapter just feels a little bit lazy in that regard. I mean, hey, Luffy's running in a random direction on this massive wasteland, and oh look, in the middle of nowhere, here's Zoro, who just happens to be here as well. Oh, and Hawkins is is also there in, in nowhere. I don't know, I'm just not sold on how this has happened, but I am keen to see where things go. Either we've got an alliance brewing, or we're gearing up to see a fight between three worst generation members. I'm pretty happy either way. But back to the swords. The presence of the Nidai Kitetsu has all of a sudden conjured a huge desire within me to see Zoro wielding the entire Kitetsu set. I mean, imagine him wielding not one, not two, but three cursed swords. In the series, Zoro often gets compared to a demon, or at least has his aura compared to that of a demon. With the entire Kitetsu set, that transformation would be pretty complete, and I could see him becoming the world's greatest swordsman. The only issue here is that he kind of has to do it while wielding the Wado in order to keep Kuina there in spirit. Which seems like such a shame because a set of three demonic swords seems oddly perfect for someone who practices Santoryu. But we may be getting a bit closer to that reality as there's been a notion going around for ages and ages that Zoro will relinquish Yusui during the 
Wano arc and take on a new blade. Which, you know, given this chapter, heavily implied to potentially be the Nidai Kitetsu. The other option would be a straight up upgrade though, trading in the Sandai Kitetsu for the Nidai and keeping Shusui. But I don't know, that feels like a bit of a cop out for me. No, I am absolutely convinced that we need to see all three of these swords together. And maybe once the entire set is collected, there is an even greater benefit or maybe in this case, an even greater curse for the wielder. All right, last thing about swords, I, I promise. But we get a little panel re-explaining the sword grading system in the One Piece world with a bunch of what I'm assuming are some of these legendary artifacts. In fact, you can see Shusui amongst them. But what's more interesting is that this system does not seem to be restricted to swords alone, which I had previously thought. In this explanation, we see a spear and even a bisento, which looks strikingly similar to the one used by a certain white beard. Sadly, I don't think it's the same bisento unless Oda got super lazy with drawing it. It's hard to describe, but Whitebeard's weapon had a rectangular part protruding into the actual blade portion, whereas the bisento in this image is just pure blade. All right, I'm sick of talking about swords and sharp things in general. So, Tama. I can hear the screams of Tama for Nakama being yelled around the world as we speak, because there's a tricky thing at play here, and that is a promise. Now in Shonen Manga, a promise is more powerful than any sort of haki, nen, chakra, or riatsu, so it's not generally something that an author like Oda would just casually throw in. So I fully expect this promise to be realized or modified in some way by Luffy, which could lead one to immediately jump to the thought that Tama could be the next crewmate. But I think that's unlikely to be the case, primarily because Tama has to hold up her end of the bargain first and become an enchanting Kunoichi. So if she does ever sail with the Straw Hats, it'll be like a decade down the line from now. And you know what? This promise will probably be very similar to Luffy's promise to Shirahoshi, actually, and something to be kept way, way, way into the future of the series, possibly the end. So a couple of things I haven't mentioned yet. Mr. Tengu is apparently waiting for someone. My first thought is that it might be Kinemon or even Kanjiro, and that Hitetsu is part of the resistance against Kaido. But if that was the case, then I'm not sure why Kinemon has waited this long to contact him, given that he's been on Wano for quite some time now. So it's probably another party, to which I have very few ideas on. I know, shameful. So who knows, maybe it's that one guy who was shown visiting Crocus on that cover page that time. All right, next up, poisonous animals. It felt a bit weird warning Luffy not to consume a poisonous animal because he seems to be immune to pretty much every poison in existence, thanks to Magellan. I'm glad that this was mostly used for a gag though, with Zoro claiming that that explains why his stomach hurts. And finally, this is sad news, but there will indeed be a break next week. Sad, sad news, especially right at the beginning of an arc where you just want to keep exploring things more and more. But what can you do? At least things didn't end on some sort of big cliffhanger. So let's all just chill out for a couple of weeks and resume our wonderful journey later. That pretty much does it for chapter 912. If you enjoyed this video, then feel free to like, favorite, or subscribe. And if you are in any way keen on supporting independent creators, then also feel free to check out my Patreon, Discord server, or Twitter, the links to which are in the handy description below. Finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the chapter. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.